would also like to thank student activities and the staff here at SUNY Orange for their support in this event. Since the publication of On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin in 1859, the theory of evolution by natural selection has caused considerable tension between many throughout the world. In the spirit of honesty, inqu honest inquiry and intellectual rigor that is so valued in institutions of higher learning, such as our fine college at SUNY Orange, it is my pleasure to introduce two, our two debaters tonight. Eugene Pepe has both a BA in chemistry and MAT in secondary education chemistry. He originally started his career as RD scientist and then progressed to a telecommunications engineer. He later changed his focus to teaching chemistry and forensics. We here at SUNY Orange are very thankful to Mr. Pepe for taking the time to join us tonight for this debate. Everyone please join me in welcoming Eugene Pepe. Dr. Walter Jan has a bachelor's degree in biology from Penn State University, a master's degree in education from Widener University, and a PhD in biology from Temple University. He was a Peace Corps te uh, teacher trainer in Paraguay for two years. Dr. Jan has been a professor at SUNY Orange for 15 years, where he currently teaches genetics, A&P, prehistoric life, and various other biology courses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter Jan. Like okay, points. so the way, we'll, the way we'll proceed is the following. The debate will consist of 25-minute 20, uh, introductory statements from both sides. After the 25-minute introductory <laughs> statements, the 3 by 5 cards, uh, no cards, will be collected. The introductions will be followed by 5-minute rebuttals from each side. Each of these 5-minute rebuttals followed by 3-minute responses to the rebuttals. After the series of introductions and rebuttals, uh, an equal amount of audience questions for each side will be read to each side. They will have a maximum of two minutes to respond to each question. Following the question period, each side will have five minute closing statements. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, just wanted to start off tonight with a uh, uh, with a scripture, um, and there's two scriptures that I want to use for this particular talk tonight. The first one is Romans 1:20, uh, for the invisible things of Him. Oh, we got a little. Uh, for the invisible things of Him from the well, you can see it of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And the second verse that I use for tonight, and so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, and, you know, what we do uh, tonight is we're talking about uh, not creation versus evolution. We're talking about two viewpoints. We're talking about two worldviews. One is a biblical, and one is man's view. And I take the position that... Uh, uh, from the Bible, that uh, it's a biblical worldview, and from there, um, you know, I make sense of the world and everything and all the science that I see, and what happened in the past, I can bring into the present world and to what's happening today. Uh, some of the topics for tonight uh, that we're going to cover are the Bible has answers. I'm going to go over a little bit about the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the fossil record, and the origin of uh, dinosaurs. Uh, William uh, Praveen uh, is a professor at Cornell, uh, professed a statement that said, let me summarize my views on what modern elementary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. And the first thing you have to say is we're sending our children to, uh, you know, to educational institutions, and this is the kind of statements that they're making. You know? And is this a true statement? And the first thing that I have to do is I have to go back to the Bible to see is it true or not because that's my foundation. The Bible has answers. Who created? God. Uh, what was created? All things. How is it created? By his power. Okay. And when was it created? In the beginning. And how long did it take to create? Six days. Okay. We only need to read the Bible to make sense of the world that's around us today. 
the days of creation, the book of Genesis describes the supernatural, uh, literal creation uh, week with 24 hour days. Okay, and this is uh, something that's been put forth in dictionaries and lexicons. Uh, you know, and who writes a lexicon? Uh, lexographers, and who are they? They're the top Hebrew scholars in the world. Uh, the most widely recognized Hebrew lexicons and dictionaries of the Hebrew language uh, published in the 20th century affirm that the designation day in Genesis 1 can only mean one thing. It is meant to communicate a 24-hour day, respectively a solar day. Okay, so we're going to take creation days as literal days. And one of the things that uh, often comes to be is that, um, you know, we kind of look at creation scientists and say, well, you know, these people are crackpots and they really don't understand a lot of the science that's out there, you know, and they don't understand the evidence. And, you know, and who are these people? They don't have degrees. Uh, Answers in Genesis is one of the leading uh, creation ministries in the world. And there's a list of uh, who they have on staff. They have all these doctors who went to secular universities and were granted PhDs and MDs. And some of them sat on the chair for Brown University for 30 years. And so when we look at these uh, scientists, they're looking at the same evidence, the creation and the evolutionist at the same evidence. And so to say that we don't understand the science is really not justified because these uh, degrees were granted by secular universities. Uh, these are some other scientists. I know it's very small. It's just to give you a list of scientists from the past. And also, you know, a lot of scientists from the you know, from early history who believed in a literal creation, who believed in creation and, and sought the Bible for their answers in every aspect of life, and especially science. And during the age of Newton, just before Darwin, just after Darwin, and up until the modern day. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, I bring into the forefront here is do you believe the Ten Commandments? You know, a lot of times we get, you know, you take the Bible, is it literal? Do we take it at face value? How are we supposed to interpret it? Well, uh, do you understand what the Ten Commandments teach? Uh, the language we can understand is an allegory. Uh, no, it, it's real history. You know, if we read Commandment 4 above, uh, what we say is, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So if we're going to look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and we're going to accept them as being real, then we need to accept the Fourth Commandment as well. Uh, what is evolution? Uh, there is no set standard for what they define evolution to be. If you ask ten evolutionists, you're going to get ten different answers. Uh, evolution is an ideology. It's based upon uh, matter, energy, and the universe, uh, materialism. Um, evolution is the ideology. There's no creator God. Okay? If, uh, if the evolution is true, then the Bible must be wrong. If the Bible is true, then evolution must be wrong. This is a logic question. Uh, we have two opposing arguments, and according to logic, it says only one of them can be correct. Uh, the first question that I want to get to is, I don't want to, I want to get to the origins. You know, what is, what do we know about the Big Bang? You know, the Big Bang started 13 to 15 billion years ago. It was a Big Bang, this fireball explosion. Okay, it occurred. And my question is, where did the matter come from that created that fireball? And if we look, uh, you know, if we look at some of the responses from, our, from the secular world, the evolutionists of the world, we see that, no wonder why they're confused, um, for the reason being is that the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. And, you know, it's interesting is that uh, they don't profess to have a creator God, and throughout the Bible we see that, the, you know, there are miracles and we have a miracle maker. You know, we have a reasonable faith. Uh, evolution clearly needs miracles, but they don't have a miracle maker. Uh, it's a blind faith. Um, and then we, we move to the next point. Uh, is this was in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in Discover Magazine, uh, it was on the front cover, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. It's a marvelous statement. And it given us the science, you know, Discover has given us all the science we really don't want to know. And uh, Joseph uh, Silk said, it's only fair to say that we still have a theory without a beginning. And I have to give him credit, it's a very honest statement, it's very fair. They have no beginning for what they believe. 
and uh, Sten Oddwald uh, said that astronomers have not the slightest evidence for the supposed quantum production of the universe out of a primordial nothingness. Uh, and as we look at this, you know, and being a chemistry teacher, I love chemistry and I love physics. And, you know, we kind of look at the words that are put out there and, you know, and we're going to have a you know, quick little lesson here is that we had nothing and then we had something. And, you know, and the, the problem that I have with that is, you know, did we go a little bit too fast with that? And, you know, they use uh, these fancy words where we get into stuff like quantum fluctuation. And basically, I, I you know, kind of think that works out to be magic because they really don't have an answer, but yet they make uh, an argument that there is an answer. Uh, the next question is, you know, who made God? You know, and unfortunately, this is where, you know, we get to the debate and most Christians fail and fall short is because we need to go to the Bible of who God is. God is an eternal being, and as it says, uh, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I am the al Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, we first have to go to God and then to his creation only to see that we have a creator. And, you know, we have a lesson because we need to also incorporate some logic and some science. And we have three options here. The universe created itself, the universe has always existed, and the universe was created. Okay? And there's no, you know, there's no real way to, to, to do this. But, you know, two questions to ask yourself is, can something create itself? And the first thing is you would have to say, no. And then we would have to say, can nothing create nothing? And the answer to that would also have to be no. And in order to, to say yes to either one of those, we would have to violate uh, two laws of science, cause and effect and the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, the universe created itself. Out of nothing, nothing comes. An effect cannot be greater than its cause. And in this case, the cause would be nothing. Uh, nothing cannot be greater than something. Uh, one of the basic laws of physics ex uh, is expressed in the Latin phrase, ex uh, nihilo nihilo fi uh, fit. From nothing, nothing comes. Uh, so it's a tremendous faith of leap uh, <clears throat> leap of faith uh, to believe that the universe with all its you know intricacies emerged from nothing and and you know and to put things like that and you know and to put faith into something like that you know would you know would not really be uh, you know plausible and you know the atheist is not supposed to have any faith which is exactly uh, you know what is exhibiting when he believes in this uh, if there was ever a time when nothing existed, what would have had that change? You know, there must have been something foreign introduced to make the change, which means something existed. Something had to be self-existent, and that is either God or matter. It cannot be matter, since we know from science. Uh, since we know from since we know from science, uh, it was created that it's completely absurd. Something cannot both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same way. Concluding that. Uh, including that the world created or caused something is simply not rational. Such a divisive system would be in violation of the law of conservation of energy, uh, which states energy can never be created nor destroyed and is therefore deemed impossible by uh, mainstream physics. So from there, we are able to exclude the first option and we're left with two. And from there, we move on to the second law of thermodynamics. And the thermodynamics talks about there's a finite amount of energy, and the analogy would be a car. And after about 300 miles, the car would run out of fuel and it can no longer move. And there are no refills. The same thing holds true for our universe. There's a finite amount of energy out there, and through thermonuclear fusion, we have lighter to heavy elements. And, you know, and if they're saying the universe is 13.7 billion years old, that indicates there was a beginning. 13, 7 point billion years ago, the universe had more energy. And if the universe had no beginning, that would have an infinite number of years, old, you know, it would have an infinite number of years of age, and therefore it would be older than trillions of years. And, you know, infinity means no, no amount of time can violate, you know, uh, those laws. And unfortunately, the universe, uh, you know, is, is not eternal. And we say that, you know, infinity is time without end, it's boundless, it has an unlimited extent of time. So we keep going backwards and we would find out, based upon today, that since there would be no refills, the, you would die a, oh, oh, trouble here. We would die a slow death, heat death. We would actually, you know, freeze to death. The universe cannot be infinite, there's no beginning, or it would be out of energy. So therefore, our second possibility 
would have to be excluded. And the only one that's left that's rational is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And again, we go back to uh, two sources, uh, God's word and his creation that verify a creator. Logic and who made God, there's two possibilities. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we have a regression of God's back to an all-powerful creator God. And we have one God who created everything. And this is what we call the principle of Occam's razor. And this states that the explanation of any phenomenon should, be, should make as few assumptions possible. Um, and we go back to God's word again. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no one else. I am God and there is no one like me. And at the origin of the universe. If, if evolution is unable to explain the origin of matter and energy through naturalistic means, then it is without a foundation. And that's really where I look at. I look at the foundation, and I don't look at the, uh, you know, I don't look at things past that because unless we have the foundation, then, uh, you know, we can't move on because then we make assumptions on, on things before that. And since evolution is based upon naturalism, all things in the universe must be explained in terms of naturalism. If you can't explain where matter came from, then evolution is left with, is left with a giant hole. There is no foundation. Um, and what I do, where I come into this now, uh, is why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith and I will tell you about my faith. Tell me what your faith has to offer and I'll tell you what my faith in Jesus Christ has to offer. Because it's logical to, and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown magical events, created the universe. So we are looking at four questions tonight. So the first one um, was the origin of the universe. The second one would be the origin of life. How did life start? And we have two possibilities, again, for life. Life evolved by natural processes and life was created. And sometimes people will come up with a third choice and they will say outer space. And that's not, uh, that's not, a, uh, that's not another uh, choice. It only moves the question to outer space. And the model of evolution, uh, about 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth form. Uh, you know, and it's nice to know that you know, a pool of chemicals gives us such a positive outlook. Chemicals were formed in the primor primordial soup. Chemicals bonded together to form molecules, and molecules bonded together to make a living cell. And what that really amounts to is that time and chance would equal life. And again, we go back to I go back to the Bible. For him, all things are created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created for him and by him. And notice the word of the use all. He means all. And, and just to kind of clarify, even for us, he even put invisible and visible. God was very explicit. And we're going to take a, a quick uh, time to review some biology terms. We're going to talk about atoms. Atoms are the basic unit of matter. Molecules are a specific arrangement of matter. Um, atoms, uh, the example is water. Amino acids are specific arrangements of molecules. And proteins would be specific arrangements of amino acids. Uh, some of you may have been out of the biology class for, you know, for a year or two, so that's the reason that I, I went over that, just to, uh, to clarify that. And as we look backwards, uh, we always see attempts to create life. And you know, Miller uh, was out not to create life, but he was out to create the building blocks of life. Uh, notice I didn't say life um, because I want to make sure that you know, we have the right facts out there. Miller did get amino acids. Um, however, uh, you know, why do we need a creator God you know, when we can do it ourselves is the real question that they're asking in the textbooks and in the classrooms today. So we need to look at the rest of the story first. We need to apply some critical thinking. Why did Miller use the gases he did? Uh, methane, ammonia, and no oxygen. And the second question is, what type of amino acids did Miller get? Uh, Miller did get amino acids, but uh, something interesting happens. Uh, we need a creator. Uh, why did he leave out oxygen? Well, oxygen is, uh, is, is necessary for life. However, it prohibits, the, it prohibits the formation of life. Life can't start with it, and life can't be supported without it. Uh, he did get amino acids. He got 2,000. He did get amino acids. There, were, there are about 2,000 different types. However, uh, only 20 are used in life. Uh, life is very selective. If you get the wrong amino acid, you're in trouble. 
Uh, left and right-handed amino acids are uh, mirror images of each other, and Miller was able to produce about a 50-50 mixture. Uh, and that's a recipe for death and not for life. And it's interesting, as we go back into the, the, the latest literature, is that it says the only trend in the recent literature is the suggestion of far more oxygen in the early atmosphere than ever, anyone had ever imagined. So if that was actually the case, we would not be able to have the life uh, you know, being born in a test tube or in the primordial sea, as they said. Uh, what a, what's the other use of oxygen? If there was no use in the oxygen, uh, we, none of us would probably be here today at all for the simple fact that oxygen is necessary in ozone, which filters out the UV rays. Otherwise, we would be crispy critters. <laughs> And Miller knew, based upon empirical science, you know, on the that in the presence of oxygen, life cannot start. It's necessary to sustain it. But um, you know, remove that, we become the crispy critters, and okay, and it destroys the molecular bonds that would be formed. And so, therefore, when we look at it, uh, you know, the other thing we can say: Did life start in the oceans? And that is not possible due to hydrolysis. And let's talk about the types of amino acids. There are uh, over 2,000 types of amino acids. Only 20 are used in life. Uh, the difference is that they have the same components, but they're mirror images of each other. And the body has uh, you know, trillions of amino acids that are all 100% left-handed in every protein. All life forms have only left-handed, and not even a single right-handed amino acid. Uh, and the textbooks, you know, one of the things that the textbooks do is they fail to state that he got a 50-50 uh, 50 mixture. Uh, you know, if we're going to put the story out there, we need to put all the facts out there so that uh, we're able to critically think and see what's being presented to us. Um, and, and the interesting part is it always starts to the left, these amino acids, and when we die, they, saw, they start to progress towards the right. And you know they naturally revert back to right and left, and the tendency is always away. The tendency is always away from life, never towards it. And the more you learn about science, the more it brings you closer to a creator. And you know, and the I go to Romans 1, 19 and twenty again, because that which I have known God has manifested in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even as an eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. And the interesting part is, is even people like Miller know deep in their hearts that there is a creator, uh, but unfortunately they reject him. So that you have five minutes, five minutes left. Okay. If, if he needs like another five to wrap up, and I, I don't mind him Thank you. Uh, and then we move on to uh, Mr. McFadden, and he said the simplest living cell could not have arisen by chance. Just like the eye, the, uh, the protocell must have evolved from simple uh, ancestral cells, presumably by a process of natural selection. But the first big problem with, with this is where the origin of life arises. Uh, where are all the simpler life forms? And also, uh, Franklin Harold said the origin of life is also a stubborn problem with no solution in sight. Um, and now that we have an understanding of the foundation of evolution, why is evolution without a foundation? Because there is no natural uh, processes that can cause life to originate. Um, and again, I go back to, why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith, and I will tell you about my faith. Tell me what your faith has to offer, and I'll tell you what my faith in Jesus Christ has to offer you. And therefore, our logical deduction is that it's reasonable and logical to believe that God, not some unknown event, created life. And as we move on into the fossil records, uh, most of the time what happens is we don't ask the right question. We need to go to the foundation. And up here I have a little diagram uh, that shows the simple, uh, a simple cell. Um, and the problem is, again, we have a cell up there. We're making the assumption that life actually originated uh, the way they said it did. And uh, we look at morphology, and do you have morphology? That's the question to ask. What is morphology? Well, that's things that have shapes. If you don't have morphology, you would simply be a blob. Um, and we start with a single cell, and as we move up, they, we are not to assume, but you know, we need to go back to the, um, the transitional fossils in the Cambrian and the Precambrian layer. And with all of these different um, 
variations, we're supposed to see millions and millions and millions of fossils that would show these transitional fossils. And how many do we find? We find zero. Um, there's a sudden appearance of complex creatures created after their kind. And you know, one of the things, one of the questions I have gotten before is, you know, uh, what about the, you know, the legs on a whale that they found in the fossil? And what, you know, and my response to that is, what do you call a four-inch uh, knob on a whale? You call it a pimple, because the whale's 70 feet long. And, you know, <laughs> and as we look into it, we find out that vestigial organs are actually not vestigial, they're actually used in mating. So a lot of that information is still conveyed in the textbooks, and it's, and it's false. And as we looked, uh, we look at, um, you know, uh, Ernest Marr, who's Darwin, uh, who would be the Darwin of the 20, uh, 20th century, and out of all of these transitional fossils, uh, he has only about a half dozen alleged transitional fossils. And they actually provide more proof of a creator than random chance. Uh, given the fact, and again, you know, it's even in the words that they use, given the fact of evolution, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual steady change from ancestral forms to the, to the descendants. But this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every series. And so based on the evolution model, the entire, the entire foundation of Darwinian evolution is missing. And again, I go back to why should I accept evolution when you cannot pro uh, produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith and I will tell you about my faith. And so now we have an understanding about the uh, foundations of evolution. Uh, why evolution is without a foundation? Because there's no natural processes uh, that can cause life to originate and we cannot find any of the transitional fossils that, you know, if it did happen, uh, we do not find any of those transitional fossils in the fossil record. So the logical deduction is we have a rock solid foundation that it's logical and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown events, created all life after its kind. And evolution is still seeking questions to these foundational questions. And the last one uh, is that uh, we're, the common question is what happened to the dinosaurs? And the more important question is, where did the dinosaurs come from? Uh, you know, when we go to these museums, we always you know, hear about what happened to the dinosaur. But we never, ha we never see an exhibit that says, where did the dinosaurs come from? They just don't exist. Uh, the standard story is dinosaurs evolved 22, uh, 220 million years ago. Uh, the thing that I would have to put forth there is great claims require real evidence. And the origin, the question of origin of dinosaurs is one that has puzzled paleontologists for many years. Seconds left, he nailed it. <laughs> Three seconds left, he nailed it. Were well, you going to be standing mostly over here? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I'll follow you. <laughs> Can you guys see all right? You good? All right. Good, thanks. It is so wondrous in how well adapted it is uh, to the uh, various habitats that uh, organisms uh, live in. Now, how did it get this way? Well, we have three models. We have an evolution model, a creation model, and a design model. And we therefore should test those to see which are supported by the data and which are undermined by uh, the data. Now, uh, I was mentioned that there are different worldviews, and I agree because um, AIG comes with a statement of faith where you must, to be a member of this society or a employed or a volunteer, agree by this. 
It doesn't matter if you are proven wrong. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. This is what you have always sworn to believe, whether or not you are right. So that is a difference in worldview. I admit that I could be wrong. I could be a creationist if the evidence supported that. I would be a design advocate if the evidence supported that. I would not, like they did in the Dark Ages, say that my beliefs will always, always be right, no matter what the evidence is. When you look at their uh, goals, etc., evolution is a biological theorem. And when I read their goal, their vision, their mission, I don't see anything biological mentioned. So we certainly do have a difference in worldview. I'm here for science. I want to understand how the world works. And so therefore, I would like to examine uh, these three models uh, with six uh, fields of study. The classification of life, anatomical evidence, fossil evidence, genetic evidence, rheological evidence, and variation to explain how this got to be so wonderful. Um, as we begin with the classification of life, uh, as you had pointed out, the creationists, one of their main uh, premises is that there are kinds. Only real biological group is the kind. No common ancestry exists except in kinds. No kinds can evolve into another. All kinds have existed since the first week of life on Earth. Um, Marsh has stated that kinds are very easy to see, which begs the question, what is a kind? I would invite any creationist here to provide a list, please. What do you mean by kinds? Could I see a list? Can I please see what living and fossil animals are included in this list? Because last I checked, after 7,000 years of using the word kind, no one has any idea what it means, making it very difficult to test. One of the reasons we don't understand what it means is because if you go to many creationist websites, such as AIG, sometimes they'll use it as equivalent to a species. Sometimes they'll use it as equivalent to a family. Sometimes they'll use it as equivalent to an order. They keep changing. Let's just take a moment and say, for the sake of argument, that a kind is something between species and family. Every creationist I've ever met holds that. All right, so let's just say that this is true. If that creationist model is correct, and we look at these three images, which of these is less related to the others, less similar to the others? The answer is they are all equally unrelated. They are three different kinds, none of which have anything to do with each other. How about these? Which of these is less related to the others? The answer is they are all separate kinds, none of which have any similarities to each other. There are no anatomical, genetic, or embryological uh, predictions we can make about similarities based on one because they are all equally unrelated. If the creationist model of kind is true, each of these is as unrelated to an oak tree as they are to each other. Each of these is as unrelated to me as they are to each other. Each of these is unrelated to a one-celled bacteria as they are to each other. Now, for you parents out there, I'm sure many of you are thinking, my you know, children had a better way of classifying life on Earth by the age of four. This system just doesn't work. There is no school in the world that uses this for a credible way of classifying life. Now, you can read into further things into the Bible and classification. I don't want to uh, to go into this in too great a detail, but here's another author at AIG. He says even beyond kinds, the Bible can make predictions about relationships. He says that bats are birds. He says flying insects are birds. He says that penguins aren't birds. He says that we should classify amphibians, reptiles, rodents, ticks, spiders, and worms together, and legless amphibians are worms. Once again, um, the Bible can be used, if you so choose, to classify life but this classification scheme is not valuable in a biological sense. Evolution predicts something very, very different. In the evolutionary sense, we hold that life should be classified in a nested hierarchy. When we consider the relationships between humans and other organisms, we see that humans are most closely related to chimps. We put them in a group. In a slightly larger group are the apes. And a slightly larger group are the primates, or the slightly larger group are the mammals, or the vertebrates, etc. And when we consider any aspect of biology, these are the terms we use. How many of you have classified life into monobaramins and apobaramins, the way the creationists claim? How many have used the word mammal? The word mammal has no meaning in a creationist sense because it lumps together organisms which have no common ancestry. No reason for any similarity. 
Only in a nested hierarchy do terms like vertebrate, turtle, snake, ver um, invertebrate, mollusk, arthropod, only in this classification scheme does any of this have any meaning. And so therefore, something that I'll be referring to, this is what evolutionists hold, that life is a family tree. And from its beginnings, various branches that produce different groups. And we can name everyone from this point on is a vertebrate. Everyone from this point on is an amnia. Everyone from this point on is a mammal or primate, etc. Now, we can test this model using anatomical evidence. And the different models make very different predictions. Now, I went to the AIG website and I typed in anatomy. I got this. And this isn't what I talk about when I teach anatomy. When I teach anatomy, and I believe this one, just as a backdrop, we explain precisely how each organ system came to be in whether it be animals or vertebrates, etc. So a difference between what AIG would discuss and what was presented in the first 20 minutes of this presentation, where not a single living thing was named, and what we would discuss in an anatomy class. What we see is that you are similar to things which in a creationist model you would be 100% unrelated to. You use your arms for different things in a goat, but you have the same muscles. You use your brain for different things in a sheep, but you have all the same regions. You have the same uh, parts of your heart. You have the same parts of your digestive system as animals to which the creationists claim you are 100% unrelated. Not only are there similarities, there is a pattern of similarities. And here we just see some of the anatomical similarities there. If evolution is true, you should demand the evidence, and I should produce the evidence. In science, that's what we do. You challenge your instructors. You challenge the ideas, and you say, I need to see the evidence. So if I'm correct, then for each of these nodes, 17, 13, 12, et cetera, you should say, all right, in the evolution of the nervous system, what new features in the human nervous system appeared at this spot that all later members had? What members, uh, what features uh, appeared at uh, 17, which all later parts had? And what, I'm sorry, because I'm distracted, what we just missed is, I lost the remote, there we go. Is so, for example, on the brain. There are no parts of your brain that a chip doesn't have, okay? Uh, all of these parts evolved at previous steps. If as we look all right, let's see. Um, as we look at the digestive system, the skeletal, for each of these systems, we can provide a list of features at each node. What parts of your anatomy appeared there? Now, this is exactly what intelligent design predicts you can't find. Because intelligent design claims that complexity is irreducible. Nothing works unless everything works. You can't have part of something. But when we look at vertebrae, vertebrae are very complex. But when we consider its, uh, the evolution of vertebrae, we see how the steps in which vertebrae appear as small pieces of cartilage which fused with others and gradually became composite uh, bones. When we look at so many of our skull bones, we see the very gradual steps. In fact, for each of these systems, now I'm just going to look at the heart for a second. Here in yellow, as I go through the various stages, these are the features of the human heart which appeared at the um, first fish stage, then the vertebrate uh, stage, then the osteichthyan stage, etc. We do that for every system of the body. Fossil evidence uh, can be examined as well. Creationists make very specific claims about the fossil evidence. If you go to AIG, there are dinosaurs next to antelope. There are people next to theropods. Here's triceratops with a, uh, uh, with a saddle on it, etc. They predict that every single kind has always existed. So I've been playing a video full of living things. Creationists not only need to classify these into kinds, which they haven't in 7,000 years, they also need now to find evidence that each of these kinds has existed since the beginning of life on Earth. So they need to go into Carboniferous rocks and Permian rocks and Devonian rocks, regardless of when you think those rocks were laid down. If you're a creationist, you believe that all of these kinds were alive during that time. If you can find them, if you can go into 
the Devonian fossil beds, which we have here in Orange County. If you could find a teleost fish, which make up 99% of the fish alive today, if you could find a flower, a blade of grass, a mouse, any mammal, any bird, modern corals, you would be front page news tomorrow. If you're a creationist, instead of giving out literature in front of a, a lecture hall, you could actually find data, publish it, and you could now, in one fell swoop, be front page news, and we would start talking about creationism tomorrow. This is not supported by the fossil data. Modern kinds haven't existed. And you said there should be millions of fossils to support the evolutionary argument. Well, I'll, I'll get into those. But how about the creationist argument? The creationist argument makes predictions as well. Why aren't creationists trying to dig up their own fossils? This is a quick overview of the fossil record. Uh, 3.5 billion years ago, we have fossils of the most primitive things alive today, prokaryotic cells. And for a billion and a half years, there is nothing else. Then there are slightly larger uh, forms of life, eukaryotic cells and algae. Um, the statement was made that before the Cambrian, there are no intermediate fossils, that life suddenly appears. That is a lie, an outright lie. In fact, if you look at the geologic time scale, there is a new period known as the Ediacaran period. It is named specifically for the Ediacaran animals, the animals which um, creationists claim do not exist. In fact, as we watch this video, every single one of the animals depicted here, uh, these are fossils that someone at AIG has said does not exist. That is a lie. So this idea of uh, the Precambrian appearing from nothing, that is absolutely false. I encourage anyone, rather than asking uh, people from AIG who have no experience in digging up fossils, instead to actually read those who do, publish their works in scientific journals, and that you can access in our library. So this is the life that he says didn't exist, the simplest animals. Then there are transitional forms um, leading to arthropods, which are not quite arthropods, which have some of their features. Transitional forms are mollusks and echinoderms. There is the AIG argument that there is nothing in between an invertebrate and a fish in the fossil record. That is an absolute lie. In fact, some of my students sometimes have trouble distinguishing between the two. If this is a larval fish and this is an invertebrate chordate, some of my students have trouble telling uh, the difference between as I do. These are the first fit. On, before there were fish, there were chordates, which had many of the features which fish possess that no other invertebrates do. The first fish looked like this. They were an inch or two long. They had no bone, no jaws, no fins. And for tens of millions of years, they are the only ones which are known, and thousands of fossils of these are known. The first fish weren't even vertebrates. So when you ask, could invertebrates become fish? The first fish were invertebrates. Here's the modern hagfish, still an invertebrate. While it has cartilage, it is only in its tail, not along its spine. We call lampreys vertebrates only because they have these little tiny pieces of cartilage above their notochords. Then for tens of millions of years, jawless fish slowly evolved new features, bone, fins, a larger brain. When jawed fishes evolved tens of millions of years later, they were primitive forms that do not exist today. The first bony fish were very primitive forms with transitional features showing their links to previous uh, organisms. Uh, there are transitional forms going from fish to amphibian. It was fish which evolved the humerus, the radius, and ulna, the wrist bones, which we tetrapods had. It was fish which evolved the neck, such as Tiktaalik, a fish with a neck. When amphibians first appear, they are the transitional forms which design advocates say do not exist. They are not frogs and salamanders. Instead, they have features which fish possess that no modern amphibian does. We have transitional frogs. We have transitional Sicilians which still have their legs. The first plants don't have leaves or seeds or flowers. Um, the, uh, there are transitional forms of insects. Uh, there are transitional reptiles which still contain um, uh, reptil uh, amphibian uh, features. Now, the claim that, I'm already ahead of myself here. Uh, the claim that there are no transitional forms to dinosaurs is an absolute lie. I understand that AIG is, stands behind this since their founder, Ken Ham, has made this. Just a quick thought, I wish Ken, ha Ken Ham all the best. I'm sure he's you know, wonderful in many regards, but he does not have a doctorate in biology. He has not published in 
fields of biology. He does not have a master's in biology. He does not have a bachelor's in biology. Many of the Ock students here, as far as I can tell from his uh, bio, have more uh, formal training in biology than he does. So when he says that there are no transitional forms leading to the dinosaurs, we say that that is an absolute lie and that before making these statements you should actually study biology. So for example, for any creationist here, if this is the skull of Euparcuria, if you could please point out what features do not put it in the lineage of dinosaurs, what it would take to turn this into a dinosaur skull, or that of Prestosuchus, or if you wanted to consist consider their hips, their legs, their ankles. If you wanted to get to Logosuchus, please tell me, creationists, what makes this different from a dinosaur that Ken Ham validates his statement? We see this in all of the fossil record. Um, we see features which we link with birds develop slowly in the theropod dinosaurs. More than a dozen theropod dinosaurs are now known to have had proto feathers. There are a number of dinosaurs, maybe four or five, which are now known to have had flight feathers, but which could not fly. Um, uh, the AIG website will say that there's no uh, link between birds and dinosaurs, but once again, I challenge creationists here. If you look at the wing of a bird and the arm of a dinosaur to tell me what's the difference, what could not have evolved. We see mammals evolving gradually over steps through transitional forms. Um, the statement that there are no legs on whales, well, whether we look at Pachycetus and Ambulocetus and Myocetus and Zygoriza, that is clearly false. And as far as four inch nubs on a whale not being a leg, they are a leg when it has a femur, a patella, a tibia, fibula, tarsal bones, metatarsals, and digits. So yes, we do call it a leg. We can go through this with all of the fossil groups. I'll get back to uh, humanity. Um, there are different models uh, in uh, genetics, and genetics can be used to test these models. There are similarities that one would not predict if evolution is not true. Many of the genes that you have are found in fruit flies. In fact, we studied fruit flies for almost a century so that we could learn about human genes. We would not have um, studied and sequenced the human genome had it not been our study of animals, which in the creationist model are completely unrelated. Not only are there similarities, there are patterns of similarities. And And genetics also tells us something which uh, AIG's website says uh, does not happen. AIG tells us how new information comes about all the time. All right, the, the claim that uh, there is no source of new information or the need to invoke a creator. Uh, we might come back to you. <laughs> So if you wanted to take the genes of a jellyfish and say, how could we turn this into the genes of a human? There really aren't that many processes which you would need to invoke, all of which are occurring within us to make one of us different from the next. Uh, one of the things that you would need is for genes to duplicate, which they do. And many of us have duplicates of genes which others don't have. So genes duplicate all the time. When we study the human genome, we realize this is one of the most fundamental reasons um, that we have so many genes is because they are duplicates of pre-existing genes. These duplicates then become modified by the same processes which make one of us different from another. Nucleotide substitutions, maybe uh, transposons or small additions and deletions. These things occur within us, but these are also what now makes one organism's genome different from uh, the next. So the same um, uh, processes which we refer to as microevolution are also then responsible for macroevolution. And what intelligent design you know, predicts as far as complexity developing in stages, many of the genes that you uh, needed to develop as an embryo, fruit flies had. Many of the genes which you use to fight cancer, yeast had. Many of the genes that your nervous system uh, used evolved first in bacteria. That is against the predictions of a little less than five minutes. With embryological evidence, there are just structures that we have as embryos that one would not predict in unless we related to other organisms. You had a yolk sac and a lantois, a notochord. Your uh, composite skull bones fused from more reptilian uh, pieces. You had pharyngeal arches in your throat. You had a tail and somites. You had 
fish uh, chambers in your heart. You had nucleated red blood cells. You had cardinal veins. You had kidneys, which would go up to your arms, the mesonephros. So embryological evidence can be tested as well. And then finally, we can talk about variation. And I often hear creationists say, I believe in microevolution. I don't believe in macroevolution. And the statement is, oh, yes, you do. You just don't know your own model well enough to make that claim. So for example, and we can get back uh, to these, a creationist would claim that these two could not share a common ancestor because they would be different kinds. However, most of the creationists I read say that these are related. But the difference between these old world monkeys is far greater than the difference between that old world monkey and that ape. These are related according to most creationists. All right. These are related according to most creationists. These are all amounts of variation which most creationists that I've spoken to and read feel can happen within 6,000 years. And these, and these among dolphins. Um, creationists may claim that they don't believe that bipedal uh, locomotion could evolve, but in their own kinds it has. They may um, say that you know, significant uh, skull changes can occur or the loss of limbs. They may have, uh, say that fish could not have come out onto land, but within their own kinds there are adaptations where um, fish can breathe oxygen and can move on land. They may claim that, uh, and there's a, a walking shark that's about to come. Um, <laughs> Uh, they may claim that brains could not increase in size as we see going from a chimp to a human, but then within their own kinds of shark or catfish or bat, we can see uh, this. On the uh, AIG website, there was one point where they were uh, claiming how much, you know, how great the genetic difference was between chimps and humans, which could never evolve. And they pointed out, look, we have two different numbers of chromosomes. We have 46, apes have 48. This could never evolve. But then if you ask, what chromosomal change can exist within a family? What most creationists consider as a kind? Well, this was the chromosome difference within one species, that another species, that another species, this one in a subgenus, that in an ant genus, these in a genera of fish, uh, that in horses, this in gibbons, this in the family of dogs, these in different frog families. The point is, if you take this amount of difference, creationists say, oh, that's too much to explain the difference, you know, how humans might have ar arisen but they will clearly accommodate far more of this. This is impossible in 8 million years, but this is possible in 6,000 years, according to most creations. On the, um, in the creations model, we'll get back to this. This was on the AIG website. This is a kind that they accept. 